open your Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. If you are using the Pew Bible, which can be found in front of you, that begins on page 1671. Again, it's John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. Hear the word of the Lord. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My name is Steve Sherrill. I'm the pastor here at Palis Community Church, and uh, and today is the last Sunday in this church season that we call Lent. It's Palm Sunday today, and today really marks the beginning of Holy Week as we lead into Easter a week from today. And Palm Sunday is the beginning of Jesus' last week on earth before he was crucified. And so today, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at, at one final if-then statement. Each week during Lent, we've been looking at a different if-then statement. And so today, the, the statement we're looking at is this. If our power was enough, then the cross wasn't necessary. Now, in week three, I talked about if our strength was enough, then the cross wasn't necessary. And, and while strength and, and power are related, they're not the same thing. Strength generally refers to our physical or mental ability to, to exert force or to resist force. And strength can be built through, through exercise, through training, through practice. It's often associated with, with qualities like endurance and, and agility and, and toughness, mentally or physically. And when I say power, though, what we're talking about today, when I say power, I'm talking about the ability to influence or to control something. And so when I talk about power this morning, I'm talking about the ability to influence or control something. And, and today we're talking about that ability to get things done, to, to make something happen. A person could be physically or, or mentally strong, but lack the power to influence others. Or, or they could be powerful, but physically weak. You see, strength is, is, a, is, is primarily a measure of personal ability, while power is a measure of one's influence. And so when I say, if our power was enough, then the cross wasn't necessary. I'm saying if, if our ability to, to influence things or to control situations was enough, if, if we had the power to get done what, what needs to get done, then the cross wasn't necessary. And I can think of two major reasons why our power is lacking. It's because we lack the ability and the authority. Right? The two reasons that our power is, is insufficient is because we lack the ability and we lack the authority. And so I want to I look at, at the first one of those. Look at what I mean when I say that we lack the ability. Okay? We lack the ability. When I say we lack the ability, I mean exactly that. That we are not able to contain all the power needed to save 
ourselves. Even the most influential or powerful person does not have the ability to get everything done or to make everything happen that they would like to get done or make happen. Why? Because all of us are finite beings. If we possessed enough power within ourselves, then there would be no need for the cross. There would be no need for the cross and its redemptive power. Now, there's a story that's found in Scripture where God shows very clearly that he does not need our power in order to get things done. And I'm not going to read the whole story from Scripture. It's a, it's a really long one. If you want to read it later, I would suggest you do. Write yourself a note, and you can find this story in Judges chapter 7. So I'm going to just tell the story from Judges chapter 7. It's a story about a man named Gideon and the Midianites. And in Judges chapter 7, we read all about this man, Gideon, who was called by God to lead the Israelites into battle. And he's leading them into battle against the Midianites. And Gideon gathers up an army of 32,000 men. And then God told him that the army was too big. And so he instructed Gideon to tell any of the soldiers that if any of them were afraid, they were welcome to go home. And out of the 32,000 men that Gideon had gathered, 22,000 men said, I'm afraid, I'm out, I'm going home leaving only an army of 10,000. But then God said to Gideon that that 10,000, that army of 10,000, it, it's still too many. So he had Gideon bring all of the men, all 10,000 of them, down to the water to drink. Most of the men knelt down and put their faces in the water to drink, and only 300 of them cupped their hands in the water and brought their hands up to their face to drink the water. And only those 300 men were chosen to go into battle. And with this small army of 300 men, Gideon defeats the Midianite army of 135,000 soldiers. 300 against 135,000. And this story demonstrates biblically, it shows us that our strength alone isn't enough because it's not about the size of the army, but it's about the power of of God. See, Gideon and his men were vastly outnumbered, but with God's help, they were victorious. Now, the next thing I said, I said that our power isn't enough because we lack the authority. Our power is not enough because we lack the authority. Now, this is important for us to remember, especially those of us who identify as control freaks. There's nothing that God's power doesn't touch. Take the story that's found in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. I, I want to ask you, if you've turned in your Bibles to, to our scripture passage today, turn to, to Mark. It's the second book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's the second gospel. So let's turn to Mark chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 35. We'll come back to the passage that Jill read uh, earlier in, in just a minute. But I want us to, to really take this story in from Mark chapter 4. Starting in verse 35. It says, That day when evening came, he, this is Jesus, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. So leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Now, can you, can you imagine what this experience was like? The disciples were afraid, but Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. 
They're so afraid that they woke him up saying, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and waves saying, Quiet, be still. Some biblical and linguistic scholars think that that phrase, quiet, be still, is, is most accurately translated as Jesus standing up and saying to the storm, shut up. And when he said, quiet, be still, the storm immediately stopped. And then the disciples were amazed. That is authority. That's power. See, friends, we, we don't have that kind of power. Over the last week, we've, if we've been watching the news at all, we've seen storms that have torn across different parts of our country, creating all kinds of devastation, damage, and even fatalities. We can rebuke the storms all we want, but they're not under our authority, are they? Yet Jesus could, could calm even the most violent storm with just a word. There's another story found in Mark chapter 11 where where Jesus rebukes a fig tree and the fig tree dies. These are just these, these obvious examples from Scripture showing how our power is lacking compared to God's. And it's because he has both the ability and the authority. And so this week's if then statement that we're looking at, like last week's statement, is one where I think those of us who are believers in Christ, we kind of already know and believe, right? We know that we can't control everything as much as we would like to. We understand that we can't just defeat those in this world who, who come against us. We don't have the authority to calm the storms in our life with just a word. But unlike last week's statement, I don't think we struggle with with the thinking that we should be powerful enough. I think where we struggle is in understanding or accepting that God will not always show his power the way we think God should show his power. See, we have our definition of what real power is. And then when God doesn't handle certain situations with with our definition of power, then we tend to question him. And so today, I I want us to consider how this ties in to what we talked about last week. Last week, we talked about how God's wisdom is so much greater than ours. That he has the perception and the perspective that we don't. And because we lack that perception and perspective, we don't always understand how some of his decisions that that may seem like he's waiting too long to show his power are actually examples of his true power. So let's take today's passage that Joe read. Let's use this as an example. John chapter 12. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You're almost already there. So turn from Mark to John chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 12. John 12, starting at verse 12, says, The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Now this passage says that a great crowd who had gathered to celebrate the Messiah came out waving palm branches. These palm branches were were ancient symbols of victory. And they they were waving these palm branches, which were symbols of victory, and they were shouting, Hosanna. Now this term, Hosanna, was most famously used in Psalm 118, and it means, save us now. When we think about shouting Hosanna, it's saying, save us now, save us now. Hosanna became a figure of speech, that that would praise God. It was used to praise God for his deliverance. And it it was often said in support of a king or a victor. And so they were also shouting along with Hosanna. They were shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. See, the people who celebrated Jesus' entry into the city, they were deliberately applying Old Testament prophecies to him, they were, they were proclaiming Jesus as the promised one, as the Savior of Israel. 
They were proclaiming Jesus as the anticipated Messiah. But the majority of first century Jews expected a conquering Messiah. When when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, they're shouting and they're praising, believing that, that he will fulfill the prophecies that portray a powerful, all-conquering king. They expect Jesus to defeat every enemy and to restore Israel to its rightful place as God's people, dwelling in, in security and prosperity. And when Jesus didn't display power, the way that they thought he should display power, they then questioned if he was the Messiah. They forgot that the the conquering king is not the only picture that scripture provides of the promised Messiah. As early as Genesis chapter 3, we have indication that the Messiah would suffer a bruised heel. I'm sorry, a bruised heel to defeat Satan. Later passages are are clearer and more dramatic in their description of the Messiah's sufferings. The most detailed ones come in Isaiah chapters 52 and 53, which, which talk about how the Messiah would be afflicted for our transgressions. Isaiah also speaks about the Messiah's death on behalf of our sins. See, the crowds were praising God, but then those crowds who were praising God stopped When God didn't display his power the way they expected. They didn't understand that what he was about to do was actually more powerful than anything that has ever happened in the history of time. When Jesus suffered, was crucified, and died, he then beat death. He defeated death. He crushed the serpent's head that had struck his heel. Through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, Jesus would demonstrate the ultimate power of God. The power to overcome death and to bring new life to all who believed in him. Romans 5.8 emphasizes the power of the cross. Romans 5, 8, you don't have to turn there. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This passage emphasizes the power of the cross. It's not just about salvation or transformation, but it's also a demonstration of God's love for humanity. The cross is a symbol of God's sacrificial love, which is freely given to all who believe. His willingness to serve and to sacrifice himself for the sake of others, it's a powerful demonstration of God's love and compassion for humanity. Through his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus demonstrates the ultimate power of God, the power to overcome sin and death and to offer a new hope, to offer new life to all who turn to him. See, the very existence of the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it underscores our need for divine intervention because our own power falls short. Accepting the sufficiency of of the power of God, however he chooses to display it, is an essential part of the Christian faith. See, from the creation of the world to the redemption of humanity, God's power is evident throughout Scripture. Scripture demonstrates that the power of God is necessary for us in many ways, including our salvation, our spiritual growth, and our ability to resist temptation. And if our power was enough, then the cross wasn't necessary. Now, as I wrap up this message today, I don't want you to miss what I'm going to say next. This entire series throughout Lent has been pointing us to the necessity of the cross. 
our knowledge, our goodness, our strength, our justice, our wisdom, all fall short. Because we lack the power. We don't have the ability or the authority to display the power needed to save ourselves or anyone else. But, and I really need you to hear this but, but we have access to God's power through the Holy Spirit. We have access to God's power through the Holy Spirit. It's because of the cross that we have access to God's power through the Holy Spirit. Let me read Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Jesus tells his disciples, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 2 Timothy 1.7 also tells us, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. We have access to God's power. But we only have access to God's power through the Holy Spirit. Revelation chapter 4 calls it the sevenfold spirits of God. And, and back in the book of Isaiah, it explains that this sevenfold spirit of God, it, whenever it says the sevenfold spirit of God, it's, it's listing the attributes of the spirit of God. This is different from the fruit of the spirit. But the attributes of the Spirit of God can be found in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. It says this, it says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The Spirit of counsel and of might. Power. The Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. This passage from Isaiah is talking about the Messiah. This, this branch of Jesse that it references is Jesus. And it says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might or power. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. See, Isaiah was saying that when the Messiah comes, the spirit of God will be on him. And that spirit contains real, complete Perfect, divine wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. We have access to the Spirit of God and to these attributes of God when we acknowledge that without the cross and without what Jesus did for us there, we would all be lost. And when we accept it, Jesus says that you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power. It is a promise. So why do we keep looking to ourselves or to other people or things that, that, that we think might be more powerful than us to fix the problems of this world? In church, the government is bigger than it's ever been. Access to to mental health is is more available than we've ever seen before. Most of us have more money and resources than we've ever had. But none of this will fix the broken state of this world we live in. Just this week, we heard about another school shooting. And people are are crying out for reform. And I'm I'm not talking left or right politics, so, so don't shut me out here. But please listen to me when I say That the world does not have the power to fix our brokenness because the problem is spiritual. You see, we're living in a time where government and and medicine and, and financial resources are abundant, but the church is shrinking. Many of you who come and worship here each week may not know this, but being a pastor, I read a lot of things. I see a lot of these surveys and studies and And every single year, more and more Christian churches are closing their doors for good. Every week is the last week 
for some churches to meet. Why? It's because we think that we can be enough. Church, if we were enough, then the cross wasn't necessary. We have actual access to the power of God through the Holy Spirit. And it's about time we get on our knees and access that power. We have to stop seeing worldly solutions to spiritual problems. We have to remember that the the church of Christ will prevail. So let's get out of hiding. Let's get into the battle. The cross represents victory over sin and death. It offers a a radical transformation in the life of the believer. And and it's, it's a display of God's love for humanity. As Christians, we should always remember that the power of the cross is where we place our hope and our trust. We should remember the power of the cross. We should live in the power of the Spirit that the cross provides for us. We are not enough. But the power that is available to us through the Holy Spirit because of what Christ did for us on the cross is more than enough. It's more than anything that we will ever need. Would you pray with me? Thank you.